So if you've uh, been with us uh, the past few weeks, you'll know that this morning is the last session that we have uh, in our Advent series, looking at Isaiah 9, where Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus the Messiah, and he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This Jesus, this Messiah that Isaiah prophesied about, he is the Prince of Peace. He is the ruler over peace. He is the mediator of peace. Jesus, when he was born, the angels proclaimed from the heavens, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, he said, these things I say unto you, so that in me you might have peace. When Paul was preaching about this message that came from Jesus, he said, this is the gospel of peace. When Peter preached in the book of Acts, he referred to the good news of peace by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But it's fair for us to ask this morning, where is this peace? How does the Prince of Peace work? Have things changed since the Prince of Peace came? It seems like the entire history of man, up until the time Jesus came, and frankly up until now, has been the same history. The history of man has been a history of war. Wars and rumors of wars. So where is this peace? How does it work? How does Jesus minister peace? I can think of no better section of Scripture to answer those questions than the second chapter of Ephesians. So if you will... I would love for you to open up your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 2, where we can read specifically about how Jesus works and who he is and what God has done through the Prince of Peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11, Paul writes these words. He says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by the those who are called the circumcision, which is just a mark made in the flesh by hands, remember that you are at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came... And he preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, God, that you have not left us alone, Lord, but God, that you continue to speak to us, and you do that through your word. This morning, we ask, dear Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open up our eyes that you would give us ears to hear so that we could hear what your Holy Spirit would say to us through your word. Thank you for this time, Jesus. Amen. Well, as we come to this passage, you might have noticed the apostle refers to peace three different times. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is the one who makes peace. The Prince of Peace is also the one who preaches peace. And then he himself is our peace. As we look at this passage, it's important that we understand the reason why Paul wrote it, the purpose of the book itself. The great object of the book of Ephesians is to explain God's ultimate purpose in the world and what he is doing through Christ at this time. He says it quite clearly, articulates it very well in in the first chapter. If you want to just glance over at chapter 1, I think verse 9, Paul writes this. Speaking of God, he says, God is making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, 
as a plan for the fullness of time. Now here it comes, are you ready? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That's the purpose for this book. Paul wants us to understand that God is working in Christ to unite all things in heaven and on earth. Christ came in the world to reunite all things, literally to sum everything up. And Paul is anxious for the Ephesians to understand that they as Gentiles, being now brought into the church at this point in time, is part of what God is doing in reuniting all things to himself in heaven and on earth. He reminds the Ephesians of what an astonishing thing this is in chapter 1. And what actually happened. And, And all this was made possible by one thing. And it was the power of God. And we saw so beautifully last week as Rayshon shared from us the scripture that God's power was demonstrated for us in the way that God qualified us to be partakers of the divine nature, as Peter said. That God delivered us out of bondage. And then thirdly, that, that God transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his own dear son. That was all a display of God's power. And now as we come to our passage Paul continues to explain how God's power has been revealed. And he says it is, it, is, it is done this way, which is our first point. God's power is revealed to us in the way that Jesus made peace with us. So how does Jesus make peace with us? How did he do this? Well, he did it in this way. First of all, there's two problems. There's two problems the Gentiles had. First one is this. They were separated from God, and they were separated from each other. They were separated from God. They were estranged from God. Look at uh, the the first verse of the second chapter that we're in right now. Look at what Paul says. He says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, even as others. This is the first problem. He continues to, to flesh this out a little bit in, uh, in verse 12, where he says in the middle of the verse, he says, we, were, we had no hope, and we were without God in this world. That's the great obstacle that the Gentiles faced. And that's the great obstacle that you and I face. We're born into this world separated from God. The second problem stems from that. Not only were the Gentiles separated from God, but they were separated from the people of God. Notice in verse 12, again, at the very beginning, he says, Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. God had revealed himself to the people of Israel. He had made his his promises known. He had made his covenants known. And he intended for them to represent him to the nations. But the Jews had kind of forgotten how to do that. And since the Gentiles were separated from the people of God... The people of God weren't really speaking anyway. They had no knowledge. They had no awareness of God. They had no access to the things of God. They had no access to the revelation of God, to his law, to his promises, and to his covenants. And the Gentiles now were seeing this for the very first time. And Paul prayed, I I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be opened, he says in chapter 1, that you would be able to see what is the greatness of God's power towards you who believe. Let me make this, this observation. We cannot, any of us, the Gentiles nor us, we cannot see the greatness of God's power in our lives until we see the greatness of our problem. The Gentiles at that time, like probably many of the people that surround you in your life, they didn't see anything astounding in the gospel. They were not amazed by the gospel. They, they didn't see anything in it. You have people in your life you can believe that whole Christianity thing if you want to. I don't see what the big deal is, but it you know, doesn't bother me if you want to believe that. They don't see anything amazing about the gospel. Why? Because they don't see the greatness of their problem. They don't see the truth of their life as they stand before a holy God. We must be willing to tell ourselves the truth. We must be willing to see the truth about our problem before we can see the greatness of God's power towards us. But that's very uncomfortable, isn't it? Man in his natural condition really doesn't want to deal with those issues. I'm much happier if you would just leave me alone. I can handle my own thing, right? I can be the captain of my own ship, the master of my own fate. I'm happy there. As a matter of fact, I really not only am not interested in the knowledge of God, 
the fact that I might actually have to be subject to a God offends me. It's offensive to me. And so Paul is praying again that God would open up the eyes of the Gentiles, that they would see the nature of their problem. They were separated from God and they were separated from the people of God. Now let's talk about the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles for just a moment. You know, at this time in the world, the world was basically separated into two people groups. There were the Jews and there were the Gentiles. And we cannot underestimate the animosity that existed between these two groups. And sometimes I think we do. Sometimes I think we forget. The Jews absolutely despised the Gentiles. They were the people who God did not choose. <laughs> they were the uncircumcision. You can see Paul's sarcasm in, uh, in verse 11 as he, he says, you're called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is just a mark in the flesh. But the Jews had begun to take great pride in this mark in the flesh. And they made the mistake of thinking that this mark in the flesh, this circumcision is actually what made them acceptable to God. This is what matters. You guys, you're not the chosen of God. You're not the circumcision of God. Gentiles to the Jew were dogs. Even after some, even after some of the Jews came to faith in Christ, they still couldn't let this go. And they were telling the Gentiles, you need to become Jews first. And then you can become Christians and come and worship with us in the house of God. Peter, you remember, God spoke to him directly in a vision and said, Peter, what I have called clean, don't call unclean. Peter still struggled with it. When it came time to eat, he would go and he would eat with the Jewish believers. He would separate himself from the Gentile believers. And Paul had to go, you can read in the book of Galatians, and rebuke him. He earned a stinging rebuke from Paul because he continued to separate himself from the Gentile believers. Now on the part of the Gentiles, it really is no different. Greeks respected thinking. They respected intellect. They respected philosophy. The Jews are just crazed religious barbarians, really, as far as the Greeks are concerned. And to the Romans, we don't care what you believe. We'll conquer all of you. We'll rule over all of you. Right? Romans love their power. Some of the Roman emperors, emperors actually put themselves in the place of God. Emperor gods like Nero or Augustus or Diocletian who declared themselves to be God. You can even see Pilate's disdain for being Jewish in his conversation with Jesus. When Jesus is having a conversation with him and asks him a question and Pilate says, What? Am I a Jew? The disdain was that great. It was incomprehensible to the people of the day, to think that one day these two groups of people would ever be reconciled. Let alone that they would ever bend knee together and worship together. Incomprehensible. <clears throat> but this is what man does. Man takes the differences between us. And sometimes they're God-given differences. And he makes them obstacles. Don't we do this? The Jews were doing this. Remember when, um, when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist and John warned them, don't think that you don't need to listen to this message that is coming because you are sons of Abraham. <laughs> that means nothing. This difference, this differentiation means nothing. God, if he wanted sons of Abraham, he could make them out of these rocks. The fact that you were born a son of Abraham that's a difference that, that means nothing to God. So why do we do this? <laughs> why do we take the differences between us and make them obstacles? Well, I think if we go back to the very beginning, we can see, you know, in the, in the life of the first Adam. Adam was in fellowship with God. Adam was at peace with God. Adam loved to walk with God and to be his son. And then the presence of evil came to Adam and spoke to him said, Adam, why are you allowing God to limit you? Why are you allowing him to, to keep you from being completely happy? He knows the benefit that you'll receive if you take that which he has forbid. Don't let him stop you from reaching your true potential, Adam. Rise up. Fulfill yourself. You can make your own decisions. <laughs> Stand up, Adam. Take what you deserve. You've earned it. Stand up, Adam, on your own. And Adam stood up. And when he stood up, he fell. And you and I fell with him. 
And when he fell, a wall rose up, a middle wall of partition, separating him from God, signified by the fact that when Adam was escorted or expelled from the garden, the gate was shut behind him. Now there existed a wall. There was a break in the fellowship between God and Adam. Adam was now outside the wall. And when you and I are born, that's where we're born. We're born outside the wall with Adam, with our first father. There's another element to this wall. If we look at the law, the law is, is God's expression of his standard. It's his expression of his holiness, his purity, his being. I can't even keep one point of the law, let alone keep the whole of the law. And because I'm guilty of the law, because I've not loved the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, because I've not loved my neighbor as myself, I'm guilty. And so the law condemns me. So the law becomes a wall that I cannot get over. I'm a lawbreaker. I'm not a wall climber. <laughs> I can't do it. And this is the world that the Prince of Peace came into. This is the situation that Jesus came into. So now how, does, how does he make peace? Well, the Bible tells us two things. It tells us something that he did in a, in a negative fashion, and it tells us something that he did in a positive fashion. The first thing that Jesus did to make peace, we can see it in verse 14. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, made peace by destroying the wall of hostility, the wall of enmity. Look at verse 14. He is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, by abolishing the ordinances that were against us. The only perfect life that ever lived. The only life that had no separation from God. Took on himself the reason for my separation, God, and the reason for your separation from God. And he took that upon himself, the sins that I committed and the sins that you committed, and he paid the penalty. He paid the price for those things in his own flesh. God looked upon Jesus now as the Lamb of God. You remember from the Old Testament, the Lamb of God. The priest would, would place his hands upon the Lamb, symbolizing transference of the sins of the people to, the lamb of, to this Lamb. And then the Lamb was sacrificed, paying the price for the sins that we committed. Now Jesus, the Lamb of God, took upon himself the guilt, the transgressions, the trespasses that, that we committed. And God looked upon the Lamb, and the Bible says that he became sin for us. And Jesus saw the Lamb of God. And God the Father slew God the Son. And in the slaying of the Son, I should say but, in the slaying of the Son, the Son then slew the hostility. He destroyed the enmity. But mere cessation of hostility is not the whole picture. If we were to stop there and just say, Jesus, he broke down the wall. He fulfilled in himself all of God's law. And therefore, he destroyed the power of the law over us because we're connected to him. And because we're connected to him, the law now no longer has any, any hold over us. He destroyed the law in its saving and ceremonial aspect. But that's not the end of the story. If we stop there, really, we have, we've come to the common definition of peace. Just the cessation of hostility. You know, it's pretty inoffensive, pretty undivisive for most Christmas cards at, at earth to, to, to say something along the lines of peace on earth, right? Peace on earth. As long as you and I aren't fighting, we're at peace. As long as this nation is not fighting with that nation, they're at peace. But that is not God's definition of peace. Jesus did something else. Not only did he destroy the wall of enmity so that there would be no more hostility, but he did something else. And he did this. Verse 15. He destroyed the law, second part of the verse, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. And this is how he made peace. So not only did Jesus destroy the wall that separates from God, but he created in himself 
of the two, one new man. What is this new man? What is this new entity that Jesus created? It's the church. Jesus created literally a new humanity. Think of it like this. We were one people under Adam. Adam was the head and the representative of the human race. The whole of humanity was in Adam. And as a Christian now, I have finished with that old humanity. The old man died in Christ. I am now part of the second Adam, or the last Adam. This is why the Bible says that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. There is a new humanity that he created in his own flesh. A new people. He doesn't just produce a new conglomeration of people. He doesn't produce a new association of people. He didn't say to the Jews, okay, Jews, I want you to give up half, 50%, give up half of what you're fighting about, and I want you to come to the middle of the table. Gentiles, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to give up 50% of what you're fighting about, come to the middle of the table, let's get a fresh start, let's start something new. That is not how God made peace. That might be how the world makes peace, but that is not how the Prince of Peace made peace. He destroyed both sides. He abolished both sides. He took away, completely got rid of the differences that would separate us. And he made in himself one new man. He didn't improve upon the old. He destroyed the old and he made something completely new. There is no Jewish section of the church. There is no Gentile section of the church. Stay with me now. There is no white section of the church. There is no black section of the church. There is no American section of the church. There's no European section of the church. There is no affluent section of the church. There is no powerful section of the church. There are no sections. He took away all the differences and made us one people. This is why Paul in Galatians continues this theme and says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's not even male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the peace that Jesus created, one new body, which we are here this morning. I hope as a church we can celebrate the miracle that is the church. Anything that says otherwise regarding the differences between us is a denial of the doctrine of the church. He made of the two one completely new entity, one new humanity. And let me say this this morning. You and I can only be at peace with God to the degree that we are a, are a participant in this new creation that he made. This is how the Bible describes what it means to be a Christian. You are a new creature in Christ. Look at verse 10. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, which God prepared beforehand that we should, we should walk in them. This is what it means to be a believer. That we would be born a second time. That we would cease being part of the old Adam, the old humanity, and enter now into a new life, being part of this new humanity. This is how Jesus made peace. He destroyed the wall of enmity and he created himself one new entity that we would be part of that and that we would be at peace with him. So we come now to the, the second point that we want to look at this morning. Not only did Jesus make peace, but he preaches peace. Well, to whom does he preach? Well, look at the verse. <clears throat> verse uh, 17. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, in context, that would be the Gentiles. And to you who were near, in context, that would be the Jews. So he preached to the near and to the far. Now, when Jesus started his ministry, did he preach to everybody equally? Well, no, not really. When Jesus started off his ministry, he said, I have come to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when Jesus sent his disciples out, he said, don't go to the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then later on in his ministry... Jesus started alluding to something else. He said, you know what? I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And I will speak to them, and they will hear my voice. 
And when speaking of his own crucifixion, which was coming, he said, I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so we see the scope of Jesus' ministry slowly unfolded. I love the story of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15 who came and had a a demon-possessed, a very severely oppressed daughter. And she so much wanted Jesus to intervene on the behalf of her daughter. And so she appealed to Jesus in a crowd. She saw Jesus. She saw the disciples trying to keep order. And she appealed in a loud voice, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says this, Jesus spoke not to her a word. Wow, why? That seems hard. That seems cruel. It seems like Jesus was discouraging her faith. Jesus wasn't discouraging her faith. He was developing her faith. The woman so much wanted Jesus' attention that she thought, I will appeal to him in a way that he favors. I I know he's Jewish. I know that he's surrounded by Jews. I know he's ministering to the Jews. I'll put myself in a place of the in, in a Jewish place. I'll appeal to him. Oh, son of David. She used a Jewish name to appeal to him. And Jesus would not speak to her. And neither will he speak to you or I. If we attempt to speak to him on the platform of something that we've done, if we think that there's some way that we could elevate our own position so that God could better hear us, he will not speak to us. (laughs) Because what is he looking for? The woman wouldn't give up. So maybe she started to understand it's not working. So the Bible says that she got on her knees and she said this. She said, Lord, Lord, help me. And even then, Jesus tested her. And he said, woman, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. But now her heart full of faith, seeing Jesus as the Messiah, said, Lord, but even still, sometimes the dogs get to take from the scraps that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said, I've not seen this great of faith. Go, woman, your daughter is healed. In that moment, her daughter was healed. Jesus signified, he called her out. He brought attention to the greatness of her faith that he developed in this little encounter with her. There's one other person in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus singled out for having great faith. It was the Roman centurion. You remember him. The man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, just say the word and my servant will be healed. Neither one of them were Jews. The only two people that Jesus singled out as having great faith were Gentiles. And in both cases, the person who needed the ministry wasn't in the immediate presence of Jesus. Jesus came to preach to those who are near and to those who are far. Both of the people who needed the ministry were far. They weren't in the presence of Jesus, but Jesus healed them without hesitation, upon the request of those who had faith in him. I don't know this morning if there's someone that you're burdened for, if there's someone that you care about that seems very far. But I can tell you this, they are not too far for Jesus to reach them. Near and far are relative terms. It really doesn't matter whether you're near or you're far. (laughs) You could be near. You could have been in the church your whole life. You could know all kinds of things about God. That's the Jews. The Jews were near. Or you could be far. You could have no knowledge of God. In both cases, we equally need to hear what Jesus has to say to us. We need him. It doesn't matter whether you're near or far. What matters is whether you're at peace with God. Have you entered in to this new creation, this new body? He preaches to those who are near, and he preaches to those who are far, equally. Now, how does Jesus preach? Well, did the preaching ministry of Jesus end when he ascended into heaven? Or does he continue to preach? Well, I think we have a a hint to the answer of that in the first verse of the book of Acts, where Luke is writing to Theophilus, and he says, All this I have written of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. In the rest of the book of Acts, we see the continued teaching ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit through his body, 
Through this new creation, Jesus continues to preach through his body, through his, through his body today. The Bible tells us that God gives to the church evangelists, pastors, teachers. We continue to teach the word of the Lord. And that's what it is. It's the word of the Lord. I want to tell you just one story of, of how Jesus still preaches today, how he reaches those who are near and how he reaches those who are far. In 1962, God put it on the heart of a man named Don Richardson. Some, some of you may have heard him. That he should go and that he should reach a people called the Sawi people who lived in a place called Erie and Jaya, which is now Papua New Guinea. And the Sawi people were known violent people. They were known cannibals. They took great pride in eating their enemies and exerting power over them in that way. They were very, very violent people. No one had ever been there to reach them to the knowledge of Don Richardson. And Don was concerned about it, but he, he felt God comfort him in his spirit and say, Don, these, this is the people that I have prepared for you. Now, unbeknown, unbeknownst to, to Don, the Sawi had heard about these tall, white, sickly, pale-looking Europeans that were popping up here and there. They had a name for them. They called them the Tuan. And they were very curious about the Tuan because the reports were glowing. Wherever the Tuans came, there was medicine, there were nylon fishing line, there were fish hooks, there were steel tools, there was salt. You know, and, and there's, they seemed to be a great blessing where, wherever they showed up. And they had heard about these Tuans, so they went to one of the neighboring tribes and they said, do you guys know anything about these Tuans? Have you guys seen a Tuan? And the people were like, <clears throat> no, you guys are so low on the totem pole. The Sawi people were were a very much a hated people by the other tribes around them. You guys, no, no Tuan will ever take interest in you. No Tuan will ever, will ever come and see you guys. And the, and the uh, Sawi people went away quite discouraged. They said, well, we would very much like to come across one of these Tuans one day. And so Don flew with his, his wife and his seven-month-old son, Stephen Richardson, and they flew to a base camp uh, in Papua New Guinea. And Don, by himself with a guide, canoed in to, to where the Sawi people were. And he, he went up on the bank, and he began to, through sign language, he had no clue what their language was, he began to, to communicate with them as best he could, and somehow he's able to communicate to them that he would like them to build him a hut. And Don recounted later that, that the people turned into like a busy beehive, and they just got excited about building this hut, and they built him this hut. And when it was done, Don said to them again in sign language, I'm going to go away. I'm going to get my family. I'm going to come back in three days, and then we'll stay with you here in this hut. And so Don went away, and the, the Sawi let him go. It seemed, seemed, things seemed friendly, but, you know, he wasn't sure. So three days later, he came back. He had his wife and his, his infant son, and as they approached the bank, they saw 400 of the Sawi people waiting for them. But they were all dressed in their military, you know, and they had their weapons, they had their war paint on, and they looked like a very fierce people. And Don and his wife at that point, we were scared. We didn't know if they were excited to have us for dinner or if they were literally excited to have us for dinner. We didn't know. And so they landed and they got out of the boat and they said that the people pressed in among them, not saying anything. Their eyes really wide, staring at them and, and pressing so close that they could hardly move. It was a sense of anticipation, it seemed like. And then sure enough, a, a, a voice yelled something in the background, and the entire Sawi people broke out in cheers, drums started beating, and they gave them an incredible welcome. They were dressed like that because it was like a, a military welcome to them. And Don said the, the welcome lasted for, for three years. They continued to be excited. A Tuan came to us. They were so excited. And so Don began to learn the language and he began to communicate to them, but he began to run into problems. And the problem he had was this. The Sawi people were a treacherous people. The things they honored were deceit. They loved when a man could use evil cunning to deceive his enemy and then destroy him and kill him. Stories like that were the stories they loved. So Don started communicating the Bible story, and he, he, he uh, talked about how Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, and that was it. We love Judas. Judas is a master of treachery. Tell us more about this Judas. We want to know about him. And Judas' stock rose, and and Jesus became kind of a dupe to be laughed at. Don said, Lord, I, I can't reach these people. I can't talk to them. I can't do it. And then things got worse. Some of the neighboring tribes heard that, oh, the Sawis, they have a Tuan. <laughs> Let's go see. And so they began to move in closer. Three tribes did. Two of the tribes had had a past history of war with the Sawi people. 
And sure enough, the Sawi people were like, nope, you guys can't come down here. And they began to fight. And Don said that his, he, li- he and his wife could literally see the arrows flying past the door. People were getting killed. People were getting hurt. And he was begging them, please stop fighting. And the more he did that, the more the Sawi people looked at him and said, you Europeans, you're so weak. <laughs> you're so unmanly. We fight. It's what we do. We're not going to not fight. It's what we do. And so Don realized over time, I, I'm the reason for this. I'm the reason that they're fighting. I need to go. So the Sawis found out, oh, he's going to go. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Maybe there's a way. We do have a custom. If there is a sacrifice that is made that is so great that both tribes respect it, that is the way to have peace. They had a, they had a ceremony that they called the peace child. If one tribe would give a newborn son to the other tribe, as long as that, tri- as long as that son lived, there would be peace between the two tribes. And so the Sawis told Don that maybe if there's a peace child, maybe we can have peace. There was one father, his name was Kiowa. And he, after many years of marriage, only had one son. He had an only son. It was an infant son. And he very much wanted Don to stay. But he walked up and down the tribal village, asking the fathers who had multiple sons, would you be willing to give up one of your sons for the peace child? No one would do it. So at last, Kiwa said, okay, all right, I'll do it. I'll give up my son. And the ceremony, <clears throat> it became known that Kiel was giving up his only child. Never before in the history of the Sawi or in the, the history of the enemy tribe had anyone ever given up an only son. But Kiowa was willing to do it. In the ceremony, he takes the infant son. Both tribes line up facing each other and he takes the child in his arms and he walks down and each member of the tribe placed his hands on the child and in their own tongue said, tongue said something to the effect of, in this child, we agree to peace. And he, he presented the child to each member of his tribe, and then he presented the child to the chief of the enemy tribe. And at the moment he did that, Don says, I recall his wife falling down in grief and agony as the peace child was given away. But then it was at that moment in time that God spoke to Don and said, this is, this is the message. And Don got it. And he communicated to the people, God, the great father, has sent a peace child to you and to me that we might be at peace with him. And that's how we people understood. They understood. Later on they said, why didn't you tell us that Judas betrayed a peace child? We would never have liked him if we had known that. You can never betray a peace child. God would have you and I know this morning that he has sent the Prince of Peace to make peace. He preaches to those who are near, and he preaches to those who are far. And our last point this morning comes from that. Not only does Jesus make peace, not only does Jesus preach peace, but he himself is our peace. Look at Paul's words in verse 14. For he himself is our peace. And then look at verse 18. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have access to him. He is our peace. Access to God was something that the, the Jews really didn't even have. You're familiar with the temple. There was the outer court, the inner court, and then inside the inner court was the Holy of Holies, a place completely cordoned off. And the high priest could only one time a year go into the Holy of Holies to present a sacrifice to God, to be in God's presence. And you remember he would go, they, they tied um, bells on, on the tassel of his robe, and they tied a rope around his, his ankle so that if he died while he was in the presence of God, they could pull him out. Only once a year could they have access to God. And then we learn from the Bible that When Jesus, the moment that he died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn. Signifying that there would no longer be any separation between God and his people. The life and death of Christ destroyed this separation between us and God's holy presence. In Christ Jesus, 
we now have access to the Father. Just think about that. You and I as believers have access to God. The question I have for us this morning is, what do we do with it? We have access to the Father. What do we do with it? How often are we able to go before our God and present ourselves to Him? To open up our hands, standing or kneeling or sitting or maybe laying prostrate and just say to Him, Lord, here I am. Or Lord, your servant awaits. And then commune with Him, fellowship with Him. Pour out your heart to Him. Enjoy being in His presence. All this that Jesus did abolishing the law of ordinances against us, breaking down the wall, creating himself one new man, becoming the Lamb of God, paying the price for our sins. All this he did so that we might have access to God. Again, so that we could be with him, just as the original Adam was in the very beginning. Sometimes, I guess, each of us, we have, to, we have to see him on our own, don't we? There was a time in my own life uh, when I was a very young man, long before I met the wife that God so wonderfully prepared for me. I was just beginning to learn about the gospel, just beginning to see Jesus for the first time in my own life. And I got my first girlfriend. Never had one before. And quickly, I set the affections of my heart completely on her. And I had a good day or a bad day, depending on if the relationship was having a good day or a bad day. And I'm sure that I began to smother her. No fault of her own. She was a wonderful Christian sister, but I was incredibly insecure and very immature. And I began to leave my first love. God is patient towards us. The Bible says that whom the Lord loves, him he chastens. And when you see God disciplining in your life, you should be encouraged because that's how you know that you're a son of God. And so I can tell you, thankfully, that God treated me like a son. And he began to make it apparent to me that this was not a good thing. I had an idol in my heart. I was no longer worshiping him. I was worshiping this idol. So I thought I could deal with it. I thought I would man up. And I, I told her, all right, I think, I think we just need to take a break for a while. You know, it's, it's, you know, some of you know what I'm talking about. Let's just take a break for a while, you know, and then we'll, we'll get it together and we'll be good. No. I thought I fixed it. I didn't fix it. I couldn't fix my heart. I couldn't fix my own heart any more than a cardiologist could perform open heart surgery on himself. God had to step in. And the way that God did that is after a very short time, she went out and got another boyfriend who happened to be the youth pastor at the church we were in. And that was it. Then I knew it was over. That was God hammering the nail of finality into the death of that relationship. And it was painful. I remember the pain. Some of you know what that pain feels like in a relationship. You don't care whether you live or die. You don't care whether you eat. You don't care what happens. The pain is so great. But that is the moment that God began to speak to me. Have you ever been in a moment of need and read the scripture and all of a sudden it's like neon lights go off? Like, I know I've read that verse before, but thank you, Lord. I, I, you're speaking to me. I see it for the first time. God did that for me. <laughs> and it was Philippians chapter 3. I read these words and I felt like I had never seen them before and I understood them for the first time. I still remember to this day looking at this passage and just seeing God's word, just seeing God speak to me. What did Paul say? He said this. He said, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss, suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish. Why? That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, that I may know Him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. <laughs> now for the first time in my life, I knew what it meant to suffer the loss for something, but that I could gain Christ. And the sweetness of his fellowship to me, the way that he opened up the word to me, was absolutely a pivotal moment in my life. <laughs> God replaced the idol with himself. This is the same surgery that he did in Paul's life, the same surgery that he did in Abraham's life. You remember Abraham. Abraham was placing so much hope, so much faith, so much trust in, in God's delivered promise to him and his son, Isaac. And God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, are you willing to give me your son? And Abraham wrestled 
But in the end, he said, yes, Lord. If you want my son, I'll give you my son. And then, Abraham, and then God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, I don't want your son. I want you. <laughs> I want you. God says that to each of us this morning. He wants us. The Prince of Peace came to minister, to reach, to preach, to save us. This he says to you this morning. Doesn't matter this morning who you are or where you're at. Doesn't matter what you think, what you're dealing with, what baggage you brought in this morning, what your opinions are. None of it matters. God would have you know this morning, this Christmas season, that he has literally done the unimaginable. He has accomplished the impossible all in order that you and I might be at peace with him. Yes, Paul says, you know, for a good man, someone might be prepared to to make a sacrifice. Even for a a great man or for a great cause, there might be some of us willing to, to lay down our life for something that's great. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners... While we were still haters of God, while we did not want any knowledge of God, while we were at war with him, while we were dead in the futility of our own self-centeredness, it was at that moment in time that God sent us his peace child, not even to live with us, but rather sent him to die, taking upon himself the punishment that we deserved. The Prince of Peace came. He broke down the wall. He created himself a new man, a new body, all so that we might be at peace with him. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we stand amazed and in awe that you would love us so much that you would literally move heaven and earth to make a way for us once again to be at peace with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We lift up your name this morning. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father. You are the Prince of Peace. Your name is the name above all names. And it is at your name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. We worship you this morning, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and for reaching us. Thank you for becoming a man. Thank you for taking my place, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your life. Thank you, Lord, for calling us now your, your, your brethren. <laughs> Such a thought is really, God, almost too much for us to understand. But we worship you, we praise you, Lord Jesus, this morning. Lord, if there's anything in our heart that we're holding on to, if there's anything that's true that we don't want to see, Lord, would you help us to see it? Would you help us to be real with it, Lord? We, can, we want to confess to you, Lord. Help us to confess to you the things that are keeping us apart from you. We do not want to get in the way of the work of the Prince of Peace. So continue, Lord, to minister to us this morning. Amen.